Many Americans want to put abortion in a box. Oh, it's just a religious issue. Or, oh, it's just a state issue. Or, oh, it's a personal issue. The reality is it's all above. And it's also a political issue. Abortion touches every aspect of our society. And it has to be fought on every single front. Philosophically, spiritually, politically, personally, you name it. Today, my guest is my good friend, Marjorie Danafelser. She is, ex- she is one of the most experienced women you'll ever meet in the political fight against abortion or nation. Uh, Marjorie has the honor of leading SBA Pro-Life America. They are heavily involved in state and federal battles for life. Uh, you might have heard of them or seen their door knockers come to your door um, when there's a key election state. Um, there's a lot Marjorie and I are going to talk about today, but I want to read your, her bio for you so you just get kind of a, a small taste of who Marjorie is. And then we're going to dig into some questions about what's going on in Capitol Hill when it comes to the pro-life movement, uh, differing pro-life strategies, political strategies. Um, I think you're going to really, really enjoy this conversation. So Marjorie is the president of SBA Pro-Life America, as I mentioned. She's also the author of Life is Winning, the Inside Fight for Unborn Children and Their Mothers. Um, she's been published in Time, The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, USA Today, Real Clear Politics, Washington Post, pretty much everywhere. She's been profiled by the New York Magazine, The New Yorker, Washington Post. She's also was the co-chair for Pro-Life Voices for Trump, part of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, a panelist on the President's Commission on White House Fellowships, on Life Perspectives Task Force, and more. She's also a Duke University alumni. She and her husband, Marty, have five children. Marjorie, thanks for joining me today. Kristen, that bio is like, oh, wow, like you're 90 percent of those things are true of you as well, except for the specific <laughs> names of some of the things, you know, like the book or whatever. Yeah. Book, no, yeah. I just love you. And um, like a daughter, I wish more a sister, but let's include sister. <laughs> and I'm just so proud, so proud of your work. It gives me great hope. Well, it's, you know, it's it's so cool to see the the, the pro-life movement holistically and all the like arms and feet. Uh, that we are of his body and like how everyone is working so hard every day, working to the bone. I know when you and I always see each other, it's like in between meetings, you're going somewhere, I'm going another another place. We pass each other in halls or at press conferences, but it, it's so great to have just like 30 minutes of time to, to talk to everyone who's paying attention uh, and really wondering what is the pro-life movement federal strategy going forward. And so I, I guess I want to start, I was on the Hill this morning um, and I was meeting with some senators and I kind of, you know, and I think you, you've been having the same conversations, how to back up the bus a little bit um, about what abortion is. Is it simply a state issue? Uh, did the Dobbs decision, you know, simply make abortion a state issue? Uh, or kind of having to remind uh, uh, our, our, our esteemed senators that it's a state and a federal issue and a local issue. Um, what have you been hearing on the Hill? Um, have, have you been having these conversations, having difficulty, really even trying to convince maybe some of our GOP friends why yeah. they need to continue to be courageous on this issue? I'm really glad you asked. It's been the battle of a year and a half leading into the Dobbs decision where it looked like perhaps uh, Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned, um, Mm -hmm. we had so many friends, senators, uh, presidential candidates, all sorts, having a case of what my friend, our friend at uh, National Review, Rich Lowry, editor-in-chief there, called sudden onset federalism when it came to the abortion (laughs) issue. Like, oh, goodness, all of a sudden I voted for the 20-week bill five times the tw- a limit at for heaven's sakes at 20 weeks can you at least they all voted for it and then all of a sudden it feels real tough and uh that mm-hmm. moment that well, i know you were doing this i know that i was on the hill every day i was in briefings every b- providing briefings every day having conversations every day there was a lot of head nodding about when dobbs was coming what it might look like what you should be communicating and how to communicate, always include mom and baby, never divide divide them, say what your responsibility will be, and it is to say, 
Here's where I think national consensus is. Now let me contrast that with the extremism of the other side that doesn't right. even think that there are two people involved in an abortion. And right. so when it came to that moment, uh, that sudden fear is what it really was. It was, mm -hmm. let's just pretend like this isn't happening. It's the ostrich strategy. Let's just put our head in the sand. Let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about uh, Ukraine. And let's talk about a bunch of issues that we know that we're in a good place are. And then let's pretend like we're not getting shellacked and painted and uh, pilloried and straw manned on the abortion issue uh, in a way that won't hurt us. And it did hurt them. Anybody that says that the abortion issue didn't hurt candidates in the midterms is, is crazy. It did hurt them because they decided not to, in, by and large on the federal level, they didn't stand for anything. And I'll, I'll end with this because I know filibuster is here, I promise. But um, the, there were a couple of exceptions. Our, mm -hmm. our uh, challengers were pretty, by and large, terrible. But uh, mm -hmm. Rubio was fantastic. J.D. Vance was right. fantastic. And then all the governors who had made That's ambitious right. moves for life, signing pro-life bills, everyone called mm -hmm. them out. DeSantis, um, Abbott. Brian Kemp. Kemp. And and they they won in big numbers, and it says a lot. That's they right. were all in. They were unafraid. They won. Yeah, no, I, I think that's one that I was meeting with our good friend, Senator Steve Daines, today, and I was telling him one of the untold stories was we actually, at, at Students Life Action, we ran against Plinos in the Republican primaries. It makes me a very popular person in some of these state legislative fights, but we had pro-life and name only Republicans that we wanted to replace with real Republicans to gain a stronger pro-life majority in the, in the state houses. And so we, the, we won these races, we get into the general, and I was a little nervous because I was like, oh my gosh, we cannot lose these seats because it'll look like we're backtracking. And we won every single one of those seats. Um, and we actually gained more pro-life folks like in places like Pennsylvania. Um, and no one talks about that. You know, like I'm like, it, it's amazing. And look what happened. Sorry. Look at what happened in a place like North Carolina. And it's all about what, where the consensus of those states are. Like they are not where Governor Cooper is. And, they're, and they overrode the veto of the governor to pass strong pro-life protections. And, and as you say, that where is the media in this 25 states passing pro-life protections? That's not nothing. That's like Kellyanne always says, like, uh, be as proud of a peacock, not as afraid as an, uh, as an ostrich. You know, look. Yeah, that's right. The ostrich strategy is a deadly strategy for a Republican, because if you don't talk about abortion, your candidate, your the candidate on the other side is going to be more than happy to tell the world where where you, they say you stand on abortion. That's right, and the media, of course, will make it even worse. You know, they they will come up with their own words. They'll call what we're doing, even when it's not a ban. We would like a ban, but when it's not a ban, they just call it a ban. Because um, you know, I think Kristen, you remember when um, right when Trump won in twenty. Uh, 15, it was obviously inaugurated in 2016. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, no, 2016, inaugurated in 2014. Sorry. Yeah. Um, whatever. <laughs> anyway, do you remember when um, the New York Times and so many of those outlets, basically, they were very frank. They said, uh, um, it is our job to get this guy out of here. It is so terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, right. It is so right. terrible. It is our job, not that we should track the truth, or we should mm -hmm. represent both sides or any of that. It's just, it's our, and that's how they feel about the pro-life movement now in general. Mm -hmm. now, I think we've made some headway in the media. You do a beautiful job in the media. Uh, I, I'm working to do the same, to try to get some mm -hmm. shame into some of them to actually uh, <laughs> provide the information people need. But that's it right. is their job. They Most of them feel that it's yep. their job to reestablish Roe v. Wade, but maybe worse. How do you um, answer those pundits? I mean, you're up on Capitol Hill. I I feel for you because I'm only here today and I get to go back home. Oh, you're really? up here all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you answer those candidate, those consultants that are here in the Beltway? They continue to say abortion is a losing issue for Republicans. If you're in a blue state, if you're in a purple state, 
You just you just need to just keep your mouth quiet um, because I, I just don't see how that's a winning strategy for, for any Republican ever. Well, say you applied that to any other issue. Say it was on uh, foreign policy, immigration, um, any uh, Social Security, many, any issue that mattered. And you said when you get attacked, the best thing you can do is pretend that it's not happening. And the advice that, that consultants give the advice that maybe they'll just go away after they attack. Maybe they won't label you the most extreme human being if you just pretend like it's not happening. Um, shame on them. But they also make it true. Once they say that the abortion issue is going to hurt you, so don't say anything, don't provide any offense or defense, and then you lose. They made it true that abortion did hurt them. And I ultimately, it's shame on the candidates themselves for listening to bad advice. And I just a point of hope that I think is truly there, and I'm sure Senator Daines and y'all talked about it, is that the Senate, um, his committee that he leads, the NRSC, the Senatorial Committee, and the Senate Leadership Fund that funds the biggest funder of Senate candidates has come around. Thank God. Well, he Steve was always there, but. They've all come around. They realize moving into this uh, cycle that there is no avoiding it. Avoiding it will kill you. And they're arming candidates and incumbents with um, words of wisdom to speak. That's right. That's why I was there. I was I was like, sir, we've done about seven hundred thousand dollars worth of research into the largest voting block in America. We need to share with you what we found um, and really just sh sharing the qualitative and quantitative research and our everyday experience of you know having hundreds of conversations on campuses. Um, you mind if I ask you there's a information of, that these. Yeah. You mind <laughs> if I ask you a little bit about what that was or is it secret? Yeah. No, no, no. It's not secret. <laughs> I know. It's not uh, cool. No, I, we. We were sharing, so our Dimitri Institute, we did qualitative and quantitative research on movable middle women and men. They were two different studies. We do annual kind of, uh, you know, we did a YouGov poll. We do it every January with young people on policy issues as it relates to abortion. But the, the qualitative and quantitative was how do we really get those people who say, that they're in the middle on abortion. How do we get them to move? I find those people the most frustrating people of saying, I know it's a baby, but I still am pro-choice. Um, and how do we really move them? And so one of the things we were talking about, you know, when we're talking with young women who purposely choose to be on the middle, in the middle on abortion, it's it's changing a little bit, you know, post row. Um, but for the most part, they they choose to be in that middle middle spot. They don't like extremism on any side. You're really talking about how abortion hurts. That's actually one of our best messages we've seen testing and in the video ads and on campuses. Because even if you're pro-choice, uh, even if you think a woman should have a right to have an abortion, uh, in your gut, you know, if you've had an abortion, even if you maybe don't regret your abortion, Abortion, you know abortion hurts. Um, talking about empowerment, see her strength. So that was one of my message was don't separate what you just said. Always talk about the woman and the baby. Because I saw some quote recently from a senator. Um, I won't say his name here, but he was talking about we just need to talk about pro baby stuff. And I'm like, that's not going to work when you're talking with young women who, you know, sadly, uh, the demographic studies are not good about women who want to have children or see themselves as, as being mothers. Um, and it's 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 playing into what the Democrats say pro-lifers are, is that we don't care about her, that it's pro-woman, pro-life. Yeah. And that pro somehow she's invisible. Like just repeat in that phrase over exactly. and over again. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they so that was just it. a little teaser of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look forward to. I, I know I feel like I don't want to yeah. interview you. Let me just ask you this question. So we <laughs> love what you do with your courage that I don't see is matched anywhere. You are matchless in walking in the middle of a campus and taking on <laughs> the most ridiculous premises and and just killing it. I mean, we we watch all of your videos. They're just fantastic. <laughs> What's your favorite? I decided to interview you. Um, what you yeah, have? You're, you're turning the script. I like this. Oh, no, I like this. Um, my favorite campus interview. I I think one of my favorite ones was a University of Texas at San Antonio. Um, it was the last place I went before I started bringing my own bodyguards. Um, that was it was a good lesson. But they the the it's one that went viral, and there were so many different moments from that night. But the girl 
just, you know, had her own poster for when she wanted to tell me life began. <laughs> Uh, and she had made up her own definition of when life began. Um, and it, it was it was quite interesting because it's, you know, you try to be respectful in those moments of this absurd statement that someone is making to you. But then when you kind of clip it and put it online, I almost feel bad because people are like, oh, my gosh, what a moron. Why? And I'm like, well, you know, I I don't do that to make fun of that person. I do it because I want I want people to see the absurdity of the pro-abortion side and their logic well, and the, the flaws that are there. Yeah, it does. It really does. And those, and those videos change minds. I actually, last week I was in North Carolina in Winston-Salem, uh, your own stopping grounds. And um, I was kind of upset with myself that I was like, man, I said yes to speak at this event. I don't know why I'm here. I'm exhausted. I get to the event. I do the speech. And a woman comes up to me um, and she's holding this beautiful little baby boy. And she said, you know, I, I don't know anything about the center. Um, I'm not a client or anything, but I heard you were speaking and I just want to let you know, um, that this little boy is here because of that, a video I saw of you. And I was like, what? You know, it was so mm. cool to see, oh. you know, e that's so she amazing. found, you know, the Students for Life group at East Carolina, put up a flyer that some, had some, my name on it. She Googled me, found a video, uh, and this beautiful baby boy, baby Hudson, is a lot. He's one years old, um, is live because she courageously chose life. She she realized it was an illogical principle to to say that his life didn't matter um, or that he wasn't alive or his life didn't have value. And so, I mean, it's, it's an amazing story. She move school she's getting her mass masters in nursing she's a single mom like she is she is doing it yeah. um well, and I'm like I, she is who we want to support and we need to be champion well um i uh you won't say this but i will um it, it was obvious to you why you were supposed to be there i guess I think yes easy, i know <laughs> i think it's easy to underestimate how little you may get of that like you just have to yeah. go for a really long time not knowing uh, knowing right. the Lord, knowing that it'll be in heaven, but not seeing it That's here. Right. And uh, yeah. so. Especially when you do politics. I'm sure that it's hard for you. I mean, you're on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. you know, not schlepping your bag around, <laughs> you know, and you're not you're not on campuses. And be, yeah. it, it's, you know, it, it, it's a much different thing. I mean, you think I was on your all's website a couple of days ago um, and I saw you guys have this really great tracker of live saved. And it's counting up because of the state legislation, federal legislation. And I think that's so, it's almost unbelievable to think about. You know, you pass a, a law, you're, in, you're instrumental in passing a law in a state, and the lives that are, you know, thousands of lives well, think are, about are being that. saved. Think about that for all the 50 years and the people who didn't live to see mm -hmm. Roe overturned. I know. And, uh, and that they, did, they just kept on whether they knew there was going to be a concrete life saved or not. They, and they'll meet them in heaven eventually yep. and get a great, uh, yep. and the debt of thanks will be there at their feet. But uh, yeah, it's just, it is, um, I think a lot of people don't realize, um, and I can say this with you because I adore you, that there, that the, the fight, um, often people hear that there's disunity. And yeah. disunity is different from difference of approach. There is 100% unity in this movement. And I experience it every day. I do with you at the top of the leadership chain. And I do with the grassroots up, which is also top <laughs> of the leadership. Um, and it is absolute unity for just being in love with the unborn child and her or his mother and wanting all that to be cherished and loved and knowing the effect that it will have on the world when they're served and saved. And that is the only thing. There are different approaches. It is not words to say that. It's the truth. Um, but that's the only thing that matters. That's the thing that we'll be judged on. We will also be judged if we, uh, if there is not, um, if there is, becomes a disunity of that purpose then we'll definitely mm -hmm. be judged but i do mm -hmm. not see that in the in the program no. movement. and i'm so glad you brought that up because i notice this is a question i get from our students a lot mm -hmm. you know they haven't been in the pro-life movement 
uh, you know, a long time, you know, a few years, they're active on social media. They'll see you be quoted in a story saying, you know, we want to see every candidate stand up in support of a four month paying cable bill. They'll see me quoting the article say, I want to see every candidate stand up and support a heartbeat abortion protection six weeks. And then they're like, oh no, uh, Marjorie and Kristen are fighting. <laughs> And I'm like, no, that's actually not true. Um, but it's like this, like, I don't know. I, I actually got mad at this reporter a couple of weeks ago. I was interviewed with the Hill. Oh, they love that. Actually, yeah. Oh, then I got really mad because then I, I threw out the misogyny term and then they got really mad. I was like, I was like, stop it. You're trying to make this like a chick fight. It's not a chick <laughs> fight. And so I what I was talking to the, this reporter about was I said, you know, when you think about the civil rights movement, are you think about I actually made our whole team read this great book on this, the, the civil rights movement right after Roe was reversed. And I was showing, last time you, you and I met for lunch, I was showing you this suffrage book I'd yeah, been reading. Yeah. Both of those movements, when you look back at them historically, there were so many different components and, and strategies that went into get, finally achieving that goal. Um, and I think that's, you know, I, I always tell our students, like, you know, if you think about Carrie Cat and what she was doing it, you know, with President Wilson working within the, the Wilson administration. Then you have Alice Paul, who literally goes outside of the White House and protests Wilson, calls him Kaiser Wilson, and gets thrown in jail to Occoquan Workhouse, uh, goes on a hunger strike, almost dies. Carrie Cat, who was pretty PO'd at Alice Paul for doing that because she's trying to work inside, she goes to Wilson and gets, and gets Paul released and her life saved. And then when you when you ask any historian about suffrage and those final years leading up to the ratification amendment, they say both of those figures, both of those women were critical to getting getting us to that goalpost. And I and I think that each one of us is called to different different parts of this movement. Um, but that doesn't mean there's this unity. Yeah, and and I, I, I don't know. It just bothers all, me when people say that. I agree with that. And I also I've I've studied those women as well. And if you go to D.C., we've talked about this, there's a Sewell Belmont know, Museum where they also, they, they really highlight those differences among suffragists, but they help you also understand through so much of that exhibit uh, how they serve the same purpose. In the end, it was very clear that even despite themselves, even when they really got mad at each other, um, despite themselves, that the fullness of the movement was brought together because they had so many different approaches. I find that place an amazing um, place of peace because because of that. Um, and the same is true, of course, of the abolition movement. Um, and then, and as you say, the civil rights movement, those who wanted to, uh, who uh, wanted uh, culture adaptation, and then folks who thought there was a, um, that there should be a violent piece of it even. Now, I, I would never advocate for violence in any way, but we don't have that in the movement. We <laughs> we're all agreement on that. Yeah, we're all in agreement on that one. But that, but that there should be a shake it up, outside yeah. version. Mm -hmm. And an yeah, I mean, you had the NAACP, ACLU had very much a very legal strategy and had specific legal cases they wanted to bring to bear to challenge segregation, Jim Crow. You've got Martin Luther King and his group of clergymen. Then you have SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, going. Screw everybody. We're just mm. going to go in. And, and then the pastors are like, oh, let's be more strategic and let's focus on the city. And then and then you have Malcolm X and he comes in and does like his whole thing. You know, it's so a lot of that is generational all, and cultural, but they all bring. It is. Right. And it's, then, it's exactly right. Yeah. And the um, also then, um, you know, between Kat and Alice, there was the split on um, federal and state. Now, that's a hill. That's a hill that I will die on. Um, because I think our nation must stand for something, and our Constitution commands it from the 14th Amendment that when the states are not doing something, they need they are required. If there's no homicide law in every place, or there's no um, minimum standard for all sorts of things, it's the it uh, it is the job of the state to make sure that that's happening. That's what the the uh, part of the 14th Amendment says. So. Um, but anyway, my point is that, yes, the differences were intense, but the goal the same. And I think you and I have, I've lived it longer than you have just because I'm a lot older than you are. But I think you and I see this every day, that uh, a little bit of grace goes a long way. 
and a little bit of understanding um, means that we actually complement each other. And it's not just words. I cannot do what you do on campuses. Uh, and I cannot do what you did with Steve. And I could not be here every day on Capitol Hill what you do. <laughs> I was only here for a couple hours today, and I'm done. I <laughs> oh, gotta go back. Man, I'd like to be back with your family. I don't, yeah. <laughs> no, I know it, it. It is. It's everyone's call to their unique thing. And I I love what you just said about grace because oh. I think you you have to, if you have a historical understanding or if if you've put try to put yourself in someone else's shoes of the and I know there's differences. And there's been differences in, in our uh, movement over, uh, for example, abortion victim imagery. And should you show it? Where should you show? And that, I remember my first time I was in like a secret pro-life leader meeting, you know, 18 years ago. And I was like, you know, starstruck of all these heroes. I had read their books, read their, watched their VHS tapes, you know, they had made. <laughs> and they were like going at it over this disagreement. Mm -hmm. But they walked out of the room as friends. Yeah, it's amazing. Isn't and it? that was that was that was so pivotal for me of like, wow, there are tactical disagreements and they're trying to, you know, everyone's type A and highly passionate and has sacrificed. I don't know any pro-life leader who hasn't hasn't had a great personal sacrifice they have had to make to serve. And so once you understand that these are people who've all sacrificed normal lives, they've sacrificed sometimes, sadly, their family and their relationships and financially. Uh, emotionally to do this work, of course, they're going to be passionate about it. And like I said, you do something I can't do. I can do something, you, you know, <laughs> you, you don't want to do. No, no one wants to do, do. it. Um, that's beautifully said. Um, but that's, beautifully said. that's, that's what makes us this team that isn't going to quit. And I, I love that so much. I was, when I was in Winston-Salem, you know, we, we go with the RV and we take our family to all the history stops. Um, and that's part of the why we, we live our, our full-time life. And we went to um, Battle of Guilford Courthouse. If you haven't heard of it, you should Google it. It was very important to what led to Yorktown and the, the, the Continental Army's victory in the American Revolution. But there was this quote from Nathaniel Green on the wall. And I want to like make a t-shirt of it. And it was like, we rise, we fight, we lose, we get back up and we fight and we go again. And it was so, I mean, it, it, it was so good because you think about the Continental Army in the South and in North Carolina and South Carolina, they kept losing and they were nimble and they were quick and they were moving the British Army all over the place, but they never gave up. And who are we to quit? And they, who are we to quit? I know. I mean, who are we to say that the cause is not bigger than us? Like, you exactly. quit, did you decide, you know, even if you're in jail for being jailed for doing some pro-life thing, or so many nuns around the country are praying for us every single day, no matter where you are or your condition, you can always do something. And why would you want to? Because it's the death of children every single day and mm -hmm. mothers who are treated like carcasses. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you there, there can be no quitting. So I love, I want that t-shirt whenever you, uh, whenever you get it made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I love that because I'm like, you have to remember, we're going to fail at something. We're going to lose this fight, but we just, the reason they hate us is they can't get rid of us and we <laughs> True. refuse. That's another And there's so many of us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so many of us at this point. Like, what are you going to do? I think that's um, one, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's one thing that has perplexed, uh, a lot of elected officials who yeah. this isn't really deeply in their heart. It might be at some place, but yeah. not not all that deep. And they're like, they keep coming back. We They were proclaimed <laughs> dead as a movement just last year. And then all of a sudden, they just wiped it out. It's completely underestimation that this is so bottom up. This is so from the from uh, natural law, human nature, like you cannot yeah. kill this yeah. thing. You can't kill the nature of the human being, so you can't kill this movement. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And it, it, yeah, it, it's, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's, it does, it's extremely perplexing why anyone would think we would, would give up. This is not tax policy. This is not, you know, a tariff law that we're, we're arguing or lobbying for. This is precious pre-born little boys and little girls who are being violently killed in their mother's womb and mothers who are being you know, shipped off to a predator who's profiting off of her despair. Of course, we're going to keep going on. Like that should not even like, why would you even question that we are going to keep marching forward in this movement? That is our, it's not our job. It's our mission and it's our life's mission.
Um, and that's why, you know, the silver hairs just keep getting more Not numerous. Not with you, head, girl. So. No way. You're permanently young. <laughs> I'm starting the highlights. I'm doing the <laughs> I can't I, afford know, my, for you my to problem be, is. I can't afford for you to get any old, any, any, cl- you're never going to get there. But say you've got a little bit of age on you, like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't have that. Uh, no, no, I love how you've grown. And actually, I think that, um, that, look, I, we're all going to make mistakes. Think of, think of the the cross <laughs> think of all the all the zigzag successful movements and including christianity over time um and how we've learned from each other i think about at the time of the partial birth abortion you remember the bill signing um and it was a beautiful moment all the guys who had been s- put their heart and soul into this all showed up to the bill signing it was a beautiful exciting day and then later people recognized that it was only men who signed. And like, all of a sudden they felt bad that like, oh my gosh, I didn't think about it. Nobody thought about it. This was an all male signing ceremony. We still got the pictures of it. And so they, they weren't thinking about that. They were just thinking, what a, what a great day that now people are looking at the massacre of the human being, seeing what it is. But I'll say it was a mistake to not have some female diversity and the diversity with females there. And we learned from that. Like that was actually right when SBA started with a very woman centered focus. And part, it wasn't only because of that, but it was one of those takeaways. So, you know, when I. I mean, and look at now. I mean, before we didn't have pro life female Republican leaders in the House and the Senate. And yeah. now we do because yeah. that was why you guys launched is to yes, that's empower. Right pro-life females to run for office and to dominate and now it's Mm -hmm. they can't get rid of us it's all women all the time i feel bad for the men (laughs) sometimes yeah they can't so many like they've reporters haven't you noticed i don't get any uh requests anymore for interviews about the male dominated pro-life movement because it just isn't you really cannot (laughs) know that means that it's male dominated the there was a and book that came out I think three years ago, mm-hmm. and it was the former president of NARAL Pro Choice America, which now is Reproductive Freedom All for All, because they realize they can't say pro choice because that sounds like abortion. No one likes to talk about abortion. They just keep running away from the word abortion. But her book, I got it, and um, it was th- she actually tried to make the argument that Marjorie, it was crazy that we were all yes, there was women running these organizations, but it was because we were puppets of the males on our boards and they were just like pulling our little strings. I was you know, like, that's yeah, you, you tell my husband that. You know, that's you. Like, oh my gosh, anybody that's ever come across, like, mm, watch out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I, it actually, was, it would be I was fun. Like, I would have told her the truth. Yeah. Also, I'd like to remind them we actually love men. That does make us a little bit different from our counterparts. Like, all voices, all the time different assets mm-hmm. different voices we need it all that's but right. it is not true that it's a male dominated movement there's just no evidence of that's that absolutely true. yeah <laughs> yeah i know i was convincing another center this afternoon uh, th- they were thinking about introducing a bill and uh and they were like yeah but he's a man i'm like <laughs> arguments don't have gender <laughs> and half the babies who are aborted are men you're totally fine introducing the bill i promise i will get beautiful young women to stand beside mm-hmm. you as you do it like yeah. i got you covered we have yeah. the gender diversity exactly so. arguments don't That's have crazy. gender and where you live shouldn't predict whether you're born or not or whether you whether you get to live or not amen you know it's the same amen, kind of sister. thing the truth is the truth no matter That's where right. you are <laughs> That's, That's the right. only God. Marjorie, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people, Where did I just go? featured I her plan. Her. I know, I know it's, it's crazy. I just featured her plan on one of my uh, earlier podcast episodes. I think it was last month. Mm-hmm. And I know I've done some work featuring uh, Charlotte Lozier in some past, past interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, but where can folks go to learn more about uh, SBA Pro Life America, Charlotte Lozier, her plan, all that you all are doing. Well, if you just Google Susan B. Anthony Pro Life America, all of it will pop up. So the letters, it's easier than the letters. Thank you for that invitation and uh, and thank you for featuring all of that. I love the work that we do together and I can't wait for next time. That's right. We're in it to win it and we're not going away. Thank so. You. Amen, sister. Amen. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, personal and honest discussion about where we are federally, about pro-life strategies, uh, and really take away one thing. The pro-life movement is 100% united in our goal 
to end abortion, to make abortion unthinkable, unavailable throughout our land for women and children. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.